Hello, welcome to episode 133 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die, the first Francis Ford Coppola film uh, from the book that I'll be reviewing, The Conversation from 1974, which is also, I believe, the year that he released The Godfather Part 2. So it was a hell of a year for Francis Ford Coppola in 1974. The Conversation uh, is a film that I had been intrigued by about 15 years ago, something to that effect. Uh, the UK TV show Spaced did a little joke where they said, oh, I, I, maybe there's someone listening to us right now, and it cuts to uh, inside the wall of their apartment. There's a guy who looks very much like Gene Hackman in The Conversation listening to what they're saying. So based on that 15 years ago and listening to the audio commentary and hearing Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg say, oh yeah, that's from The Conversation, I want to see that film one day. Took me a while, but I finally got around to it. And also this was requested uh, from a Patreon supporter, Sean. So here you go, man, here's my review for this uh, earlier than I probably would have got around to it anyway. Uh, and this film I hadn't seen before. Gene Hackman plays a man called Harry Call, and he is a, an audio surveillance um, specialist. Uh, I was going to say like he's a private investigator, but he's not really, because he doesn't do any investigating. He just um, is employed by people to... Uh, you know, uh, carry out audio surveillance um, with recording, you know, equipment to record conversations that whoever is hiring him wants to know, you know, what's in these conversations. And it can be political, which he goes on to talk about. He kind of was involved in this political thing like years before uh, the film's timeline uh, where things got messy. Uh, but in uh, the film itself, we're following this one job that he's been given to record this conversation between a man and a woman uh, as they walk around a crowded um, uh, city square, I think it's Union Square in San Francisco. And we have this great opening shot of the square and it's slowly zooming in and we're hearing like bits and pieces of like warbled dialogue and stuff. And we finally cut in on these two characters, a man and a woman, having a conversation. And what Harry Cole has done he sets up all these different things. He's got a guy up on the roof with, with basically what looks like a sniper rifle, but it's a really advanced microphone trying to catch what they're saying. He's got a guy down on the ground walking around with a bag and a microphone in it. Uh, and then when he's got all of the tapes later, he kind of has to kind of mix them together to get the best of all the audio to kind of um, piece it all into one kind of cohesive tape to deliver to the guy who paid him to do it or is going to pay him to do it. And most of the film has him kind of holding on to these tapes and being kind of uh, paranoid and second-guessing himself and thinking, do I want to give these tapes to the guy who wants them? Is this the, the right thing to do? He has a crisis of conscience. Um, and as the film goes on, we, we get to learn more about Harry Cole's character and his past, and that maybe a job he did a few years ago resulted in uh, something bad happening. Uh, and he feels like you know he wasn't directly involved in that, but he did kind of have a hand in it because, you know, if he hadn't recorded these conversations, you know, he feels like there's blood in his hands even though there isn't kind of thing. He's a very uh, introverted character and a very paranoid character and we get that through the way that Gene Hackman portrays him but also the little details like we see him going to his apartment and he has three locks on the door. You know, he's very secretive, very secluded in his own life uh, and very protective over everything that he does. He has an assistant played by John Cazale. Uh, who, John Cazale, by the way, like, uh, what an interesting actor. Uh, died young and uh, only appeared in five movies and they were all nominated for the Best Picture at the Oscars and all five of them are in the book, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die. So I'll be covering the entire filmography of John Cazale and he's a great actor and he's really good in this. I'd say I've got on a limb because I haven't seen Dog Day Afternoon, but I, I think this is probably his least kind of uh, the least amount of screen time of a performance of his. But he's nonetheless uh, he, he has a, a really good performance in this film as the the sidekick to Harry Cole, uh, and he kind of feels a bit kind of like he's not getting let in on everything. And I like the way he played that a bit dejected, jilted, uh, and vulnerable, but likable too. You know. Just, great actor. Uh, and Gene Hackman, uh, his performance in this is stunning. I love Gene Hackman and this is one of my favorite performances I've seen from him. He really has this subtle, um, all the loads of different subtle nuances to his character. You know, again, the way that he's always looking over his shoulder, the way he's paranoid about everything, uh, really comes through uh, his physical performance. Uh, a lot is done without words being used in his performance, I think, and I read that he found it very difficult to portray this character because naturally he's a very outgoing kind of person, whereas Harry Call is quite introverted. Uh, and his second name, Call, uh, is spelt C-A-U-L. And a call uh, is basically this kind of 
filmy membrane that um, sometimes grows over a baby's face when they're born. It's kind of this rare thing. My nan had it actually. And uh, they, they kind of put that in there because it kind of related to his character somewhat. And he walks around with this. It looks like a normal kind of... Um, business kind of trench coat but I kept seeing through it and I was like why is the bottom of his coat see-through and I realized it was actually a raincoat and so he's always covered by this, this this thin material and I liked how that played into the character after I kind of noticed it towards the end of the film I was like oh, that's interesting he's always wearing a raincoat um, and it kind of is almost a symbol for his kind of personality and his feelings and all that kind of stuff how he's protected by this thin shell and is ready to break at any moment and I love the paranoia that plays into it because he listens to the tape of the conversation he recorded at, be at the beginning of the film. He listens to it over and over again and we hear it over and over again. Uh, and what Coppola did, which is really cool, is he filmed the conversation from different angles and also different line readings. So there'd be different inflections on the lines that we hear again and again throughout the film. We keep hearing the same lines by these characters but we hear them in different ways and it was very subtle but towards the end I started to catch it and it really plays into the you know the ending of the film and I loved how we saw Harry getting really um, drawn into these tapes and obsessed with them in a way and feeling like you know perhaps he shouldn't go through with delivering these tapes after all because something bad might happen to these two people and there's a great sequence where he's dreaming about the girl whose conversation he recorded and she's up on this hill and there's smoke everywhere it's foggy it's hazy and he's calling out to her he's trying to warn her he's speaking to her he's having a conversation with her and I loved how it showed a dream for me it's one of the best kind of uh, portrayals of a dream in a film that I've seen it's up there with The Exorcist it felt like an actual dream the way that the fog came in and not everything was clear around the the subjects and that he could just walk up the hill but he can't because in dreams sometimes you have those invisible barriers that you can't break through and it's just you know that that's part of of kind of the world and I really liked that whole dream sequence it played into what his character was feeling and the guilt that he was feeling but also to me just as a, a dream sequence in a film it was done really authentically and it, it, I believed it you know it felt like a dream I would have had so I really liked that scene uh, Harrison Ford is in the film, he has a minor role as uh, the assistant of the man who hired Harry Cole to record this uh, conversation uh, and I really liked his performance, he's very, very subtle and, and, and quiet and stuff and Harrison Ford is a very quiet performer but I, I really enjoyed his, his nuances as well in his performance that I found really interesting and again played into the paranoia that uh, Harry had in the film and it, it just it seeps through every frame of the film you know uh, and it was so great to see his character become unraveled and then he'd kind of pull himself back and there's a great scene where he meets up with some of his other kind of buddies in the security um, arena I suppose there's a guy who makes these kind of phone tapping things and they go back to Harry's kind of um, warehouse set up and they have a bit of a party and Harry starts to unwind a little bit and then they, they just go they pull a little joke on him and he gets really annoyed and he tells everyone to leave and that's where the, the kind of stiff nature of him comes back and I, I really liked his character it was really intriguing to me uh, and while this film is slow I mean I, I believe you know glaciers probably move quicker than the pace of this film I really enjoyed the slow pace I don't think it'll work for everyone but I really enjoyed it and it was a nice slow burner uh, and the psychological element really played into you know what was going to happen at the end and I really wasn't sure I had a bit of an idea but ultimately where it ended up going was somewhere that I didn't quite expect and not in a holy shit kind of way it wasn't a big you know shock twist or anything like that but it was just a really nice kind of um, way to kind of end the story I thought and it was a really really like it I, I had mixed feelings about it and not in a bad way like I just wasn't expecting it and uh, I was very pleased with how, how it kind of panned out towards the ending but Gene Hackman, fantastic performance. I love the direction in this and the use of the audio and, and mixing around with the, you know, Harry trying to find all the dials and get the kind of the recording correct and then you'd hear things differently and there's lots of layers to it. Really, really enjoyed this film. Is it a film you should see before you die? I think it is. It's not like an absolute yes. And I was even thinking about it as I was watching the film over the first hour. I was like, I don't know if it is. But once that second hour kind of had finished, I thought it is a film you should see before you die uh, because it's a really, really, really strong character study. That's what it is. It really is honing in on this this Harry Cole character. And you see other elements of his life as well, which were which are explored, like a girlfriend that he has and how that plays into his life and how he can't really get his emotions out. And I love how that worked into his character too. It's, it just felt like a really fleshed out three-dimensional character. And I kind of was along for the ride with his paranoia. It didn't feel like it was um, 
uh, what's the word, how can I put it, it didn't feel like his paranoia was out of hand. Uh, maybe a little bit, but it felt believable, you know, it felt like if I was in his situation, and you learn that he's been doing this for, for many years, and that one of his previous jobs, recording conversations, ended up, you know, badly for the people who he was recording, and so he has that guilt to it, and, and also maybe something else bad can happen, so it doesn't feel unreasonable for him to be this paranoid about everything that's going on, and so um, I bought into it, you know, and I really felt uh, for the character, and I wanted him to do well in, in how it was going to play out, and also the other people, so great character film, I think. Uh, and to me, it really is all Gene Hackman. When you have great actors like Harrison Ford and John Cazale uh, in kind of smaller performances, uh, there's another great actor in the film. I'm not going to spoil who it is, but he's only in it for about two minutes near the end. I was like, oh my god, he's in the film as well. Uh, that was cool. But yeah, the conversation, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, Francis Ford Coppola, I haven't seen many of his films. I'm trying to think now. Rumblefish is one that I love. Obviously, the Godfather trilogy. I think that's it, along with this film. So yeah, there's quite a few more for me to see, uh, and a couple more that are in the book. Uh, so look forward to those reviews. Let me know your thoughts on the conversation down below. I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts on this one, because I do think it would be quite a polarizing film. I think that a lot of people would find the pace and the slowness of it maybe a bit of a turn off, and then maybe a bit of a disinterest. I don't know. Uh, or maybe it's just nerve-wracking tension throughout the whole thing and people love it. I don't know. I haven't really heard many people talking about this film, so I'd like to hear thoughts on that. But yeah, I really enjoyed it, and uh, that's it. Thanks for watching.